Hi guys, um, I just wanted to let you know that we're waiting. There will be three judges in here um, and they just posted our rounds to us on tab room. So I'm sure that they're still trying to navigate their way to the room. So thank you guys for being patient. Um, as soon as the other judges get here, we'll try to start ASAP, but I don't know when that will happen. Um, so just hang tight for as long as you can.
Hey guys, are you waiting for a third judge? Yeah, we're waiting on one more. Okay, perfect. I think all three judges are here now. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Hello. Are the other judges ready to begin? Yes, I'm ready whenever. And I think um, I think we were told by Tab not to make the other competitors turn their cameras on while they're just watching because of bandwidth or some other tech thing that I don't understand. But I um, just want to make sure we were all on the same page there. Absolutely. Sounds good. Uh, just wanted to make sure, can everyone hear and see me all right? Okay. I've always been a great student. When I first started learning Spanish in the second grade, I read the Spanish dictionary for fun. And I even tried to talk to my parents in Spanish. Hola, madre. That didn't go very well. She doesn't speak Spanish. Recently though, me amigo told me that I would have to give an impromptu presentation during Spanish class at the end of the day. I felt completely out of control and spent the whole day stressing out about the presentation only to walk into class and find out that my friend had pranked me. Instead of feeling relieved, the stress of the last few hours was still taking its toll because I was completely out of control of the situation. Researchers in the Journal of Cognition explain this disconnect as the illusion of control, that we as humans have a fundamental need to try to control the uncontrollable. When that illusion is shattered, we experience a persistent lack of control, leading to helplessness, anxiety, and depression. More simply put, trauma. 2020 was a year marked by uncontrollable circumstances, such as a pandemic, political divisiveness, and murder hornets. Considering that we are in what the BBC calls one of the worst mental health crises in history, we need to let go of our obsession with control 
and learn to regain empowerment instead. So today, to grab life by the reins, let's explore the causes, effects, and solutions of fixating on what is out of our control. Because the opposite of control isn't always chaos. Sometimes it's freedom. The next year, my Spanish classmates and I had to write a debate case about the best career. Unfortunately, one of our group members was sick with the flu, uncontrollable, but our teacher insisted we present without her. Uncontrollable? So I resorted to writing the debate case during class while the other groups were presenting. Yeah, controllable. And this brings us to our causes. External factors impact emotions and we overcommit. First, we let external factors control our feelings. When we're stressed, hormones like cortisol and adrenaline flood the brain and make us less inclined to rational thinking. When we react to those emotions immediately, we process them irrationally, making our feelings more easily influenced by the things around us. The Crisis Prevention Institute explains the three E's of trauma, event, experience, and effect. When a person is exposed to a traumatic event, how they experience it greatly influences its long-term effects, including difficulty in coping, managing cognitive processes, and regulating behavior. Dr. Andrea Brandt, a specialist in anger management details, whether we have a good or bad day depends entirely on what happens to us and around us. For example, Forbes revealed on November 2nd, 2020, that over half of Americans believe November 3rd, election day 2020, would be the most stressful day, not only of that year, but of their entire lives. The trauma of the 2020 election demonstrates that external factors lead to the feeling of a lack of control. Second, we worry about twice as many things as we're capable of doing, creating a control deficit. There's only so much time in one day, so attempting to juggle what we need to do today and what we have to do tomorrow increases our level of stress. Norwegian neurologist Alexander Olsen furthers that when we have a plan and an unexpected situation occurs, the reactive system is activated, causing us to adapt our behavior to respond. Having to readjust our mental game plan forces us to be both in control of ourselves and out of control of the situation at the same time. The stress of having twice as much on our plate consumes our energy because we are trying to create control where there is none. My relationship with Spanish es muy malo, just like my seventh grade boyfriend. He made me cry. This year, Spanish class made me cry. Last fall, I was zooming into class when I started feeling overwhelmed and broke down crying. Hashtag control issues, am I right? And this leads us to the ramifications of our compulsion for control, relationship damage, and health concerns. First, our constant need for control damages our relationships. The Hartgrove Behavioral Health System explains that trauma can impact our relationships by influencing our attachment style, which in turn affects how we communicate with others and handle disagreements. After enduring a controlling relationship for 11 years, author Jennifer Goldbranson spoke out about the manipulation she faced from her partner, whose reactive, out of control emotions created an abusive environment. When we exercise too much control over others and not enough of ourselves, we create trauma that damages our relationships. Second, we obsess over regaining control of our lives, which is detrimental to our health. According to the National Eating Disorder Association, a compulsion for control can lead to conditions such as orthorexia, an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. Behaviors like checking nutritional labels and cutting out certain foods can quickly spiral into dangerous habits that result in nutritional deficiencies and a damaged relationship with food. When we risk our well-being for the sake of feeling in control, 
we become vulnerable to compulsion, addiction, and obsession. I've experienced this compulsion in my own life. When the COVID-19 pandemic escalated and we all went into lockdown, I tried to be more proactive about my health by becoming more cautious of what I was eating. But my desire to regain control of my life seeped in, causing my caution to turn into an obsession with what I was eating. Every day I followed arbitrary food rules, such as not eating before a particular time, fixating on eating less than a certain number of calories and restricting myself even more if I broke a rule. While I still struggle with disordered eating and having control, I'm trying to heal my relationship with food. And by implementing a trauma-informed approach and finding healthy coping mechanisms, we as a society can develop a healthy relationship with control. So first, we need to adopt a trauma-informed approach to cope with our stressors. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration explains that trauma-informed care involves four key steps. First, Realizing that trauma can impact individuals, families, and communities, both directly and indirectly. Second, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma, such as withdrawal and irritability. Next, creating a response system in which the victim feels safe and trusted. And finally, actively resist re-traumatizing others by eliminating triggering and toxic environments. Educating ourselves on how to handle stress and trauma will help us become more resilient in the face of traumatic events. Trauma-informed care allows us to focus on controllable factors while enduring trauma. Finally, we need to regularly evaluate our coping strategies so that we can maintain perspective at what we are able to control. According to researchers at the Semmel Institute of Neuroscience, Healthy coping strategies are ones that resolve the problem in the long term without increasing the harm. Strategies such as humor, mindfulness, and problem solving can help us maintain our emotional health. While harmful methods such as denial, self-blame, and rumination can cause us to dig ourselves deeper into the very hole we're trying so desperately to crawl out of. So let's take a mindful moment. Take a deep breath, hold for two seconds, and exhale slowly. We can all curtail our obsession with control. So today, we analyze the causes, effects, and solutions to our constant need for control, so we can find empowerment in the face of trauma. Because we can't control what happens to us, but we can control our response. So although I still have nightmares about Spanish, I've realized that I can only controlar lo que puedo controlar. Control what I can control. Are the other judges ready for our second speaker? I'm ready. Yep, all set. All right, Riley. I just wanted to confirm you're able to hear and see me. My parents are in love, apparently. I don't know, all the constant arguing makes me think otherwise. For two people with nothing in common, it's pretty crazy that we've made it this far. For instance, my mom prefers to eat out, but my dad would rather find some food at home. My mom loves the theater, but my dad thinks it's too dramatic. And my mom loves romantic comedies, but my dad hates, and I mean really hates, my mom. Again, happily married. 
it seems like they can never agree, always stuck on opposite sides of the spectrum. But aren't we all, whether we're Democrat or Republican, introverted or extroverted, people who sleep with their socks on or humans, think about it. We live in a dichotomous world that forces us to pick sides, deeming anything less than total commitment as cowardice. And as MFA from Lesley University, Rebecca Joy warns, this all or nothing mindset doesn't allow us to find a middle ground. Let's face it, there's a reason most people don't live on Everest or in the Mariana Trench. It's impossible to sustain life at those extremes. It's time that we dismantle our dichotomies by first addressing why we find comfort in duality. Next, we'll assess the damage that this does. And finally, we'll find some ways to fix it. Because as Robert Benchley says best, there are two types of people in this world. Those who think there are two types of people and those who don't. There are two main causes for my parents' arguments. First, me. And second, my brother, but actually. We can blame our dichotomous world on our education. Duality as a concept is ingrained into everything that we are taught from pre-K to post-C, that's college. When we are taught the word happy, we learn that sad is its opposite. Sweet and sour, day and night, good and bad, fun and online tournaments. However, this trend within education is much more than a coincidence. Professor Heraclides of Ephesus coined this phenomenon as the unity of opposites, believing that something's existence is characterized by its relation to the contrary. Think about it. We know what tall is because of shortness. But when we only teach the extremes, we neglect the overwhelming majority that lies somewhere in between, leaving our world categorized and ourselves divided. And the problem doesn't end there. Our society's glorification of confrontation promotes this issue, whether it's on a small scale like with my parents or on a larger scale like with my grandparents. We don't just find hostility necessary, but preferable. In the United States, war, a word that should connote fear, evokes an odd sense of pride and patriotism, whether it's celebrations after D-Day war parades after the bombing of Hiroshima, or USA chants after the assassination of bin Laden. There is nothing more American than good old wartime violence. And the government frames this violence as righteous heroism. In the 60s, we were fighting the dirty communists, and today we're dropping bombs on the dirty terrorists. When we simplify war to good versus evil, it becomes all too easy to dehumanize those opposing us. And if Hollywood has taught us anything, it is that good must always prevail. In my chaotic family, my mom is usually the winner of arguments. Even if she was wrong, she was still right. My dad thinks this is the proper way to treat a woman, but it has some serious effects. First, when we limit ourselves to two options, we neglect the possibility of a third, coined by Texas State University. When we rationalize from an either or perspective and haven't considered all reasonable possibilities, we commit the fallacy of false dilemma. Take on loads of financial debt or skip college. Get married or be lonely forever. Opt for the doctors to do all they can or declare DNR. When we think in the binary, we don't allow for the many different variables, contexts, and conditions that may exist. This fabricated neutral exclusivity frames the argument misleadingly, blinding ourselves to discourse, trashing any hope of compromise. In a global pandemic, we have been presented with the question, save jobs or save lives? It's a near impossible choice. Sure, the priority should be saving lives, Without jobs, people can't afford to live. But here's the thing. When we feel like we have to choose between two sides, we assume that collapse is inevitable. And we excuse it by saying, we've got to make tough choices. But as The Guardian explains, there is no trade-off between health and collective wealth. If the virus worsens, then so does the economy. 
So here's their suggestion. Do whatever it takes and whatever it costs and do it now. It may seem overly simple, but when we get caught in the labyrinth of choices, we forget the most important choice of all, right or wrong. And this dichotomous maze not only results in overlooking other options, but it also leaves us lost. We feel the need to constantly take sides and then sides within those sides. And we continue dividing until we find ourselves at odds with those who are almost entirely the same as us in his thesis, Civilization, Society, and Religion. Sigmund Freud identifies this trend as the narcissism of small differences. He believed that communities of people, such as activists, can't get on the same page due to hypersensitivity of details and differentiation. For the feminists, a movement centered towards fighting for gender equality soon turned into a civil war about Barbie dolls. And when the Black Lives Matter protest was finally picking up steam. The focus soon became, did you post for Blackout Tuesday? Rather than, are you doing everything that you can for those in need? Don't get me wrong. We should always be critical of our activism, but we shouldn't let that criticism overshadow the problem itself. The goals of these movements were to unite like-minded people together to advocate for change. But since we can't agree on the minutia of reform, we don't. Sexism is bad. Racism is bad. Homophobia is bad. Transphobia is bad. We are all on the same page. We are speaking in different languages. Evil is united. And until we are as well, we don't stand a chance. However, we can put an end to this problem by first teaching the spectrum. Rather than teaching dichotomous duality, we can expand from teaching just the extremes to a variety of options. Instead of asking kids to choose between hot or cold, they can be presented with boiling, hot, lukewarm, cool, cold, or freezing. By presenting children with a variety of options, this duality of opposites trend will not be installed in their mind. They won't view a scenario as good or bad, but rather as horrid, decent, okay or extraordinary. This may sound like a minuscule step, but by instilling in children that there can be more than two options from a young age, this dichotomous mindset can be avoided later on in life. Second, when assessing a situation, we need to find the middle ground, or at least attempt to. When you feel like you have to choose between two sides, picture a Venn diagram. What goes in the middle? Take the college scenario, for example. On one side, you have attending a prestigious school and taking on loads of financial debt. And on the other side, you have skipping college. In the middle, there are a plethora of solutions. You could apply for scholarships, enroll at a local community school, or apply for virtual school while you save for an in-person degree. What may seem like a two-sided situation has an abundance of middle ground solutions. It doesn't have to be left versus right or my mom versus my dad we can meet somewhere in the middle. Thankfully, I'll be leaving for college soon, which means I won't have to listen to endless debates and debacles between my parents, my poor brother, through an exploration of the causes, effects, and solutions. It is clear that we are not divided by our differences, but rather united by our similarities. In a world that makes it so easy to spark conflict, it is imperative that we keep a dichotomy-free mind. So maybe my parents are in love. I mean, they've worked it out for 19 years, compromising for things they said they would never compromise for. And if that's not love, then I don't know what is.
Are the judges ready for the next speaker? Yep. All right, I think Naomi may still be in her other round. So we'll go to Kahani. Hi. Um, can you hear and see me all right? Awesome, okay. 2020 was, why did I just list all the synonyms for disaster? From murder hornets to the election to, oh yeah, a literal global pandemic. This past year felt like a horrible twist of, but wait, there's more. Like, you know a year's bad when the Pentagon releases legitimate videos of UFOs and we just ignored them. <laughs> we ignored UFOs. How did we simply avoid such a sensational event? Well, the May 23rd, 2020 San Francisco Chronicle details. Amidst the chaos that was this past year, we became desensitized to all the statistics that were thrown at us. These issues arise when we view these statistics as meaningless numbers rather than vessels that communicate the stories of thousands. We have to stop reducing human beings to data before we replace every diverse human narrative with a simple string of statistics. So let's break the numbers down by analyzing the dehumanizing nature of data and overexposure, looking into the causes before searching for some vital solutions. Because in this dark era of human history, as our compassion continues to crumble, it is only with awareness and dedicated collaboration will we be able to sew back together the pieces of humanity. During quarantine, I got like super into watching crime shows, Criminal Minds, Law and Order, Scooby-Doo, at first, whenever a gruesome death was even mentioned, I'd freak out. But when I found myself casually eating Cheerios, as the police discussed a case where 27 people had been violently stabbed in the necks, I realized I had become desensitized. But I'm not alone, because overexposure desensitizes us to the struggles of real people. We fail to empathize with the suffering of others when their struggles are masked by the statistics. Many popular video games expose graphic events like decapitation, rape, and murder to adolescents. From being numb to violence because of video games, to sexual abuse because of prejudiced films, increased exposure to human suffering numbs us to it. Journalist Kate Morgan describes how after the horrific 2012 Sandy Hook shooting, she threw up in her sink out of horror. But after the 2018 Parkland shooting, she simply skimmed the news alert and then went out to dinner. Our lack of empathy in the face of human suffering showcases, we've become numb to the actual loss of human lives. And alongside people, we fail to understand the severity of global atrocities when they're masked by the statistics. By 2015, the Syrian war claimed 250,000 lives and the world took little notice. Until a shocking picture surfaced of three-year-old refugee Alan Gurdi lying dead on a beach. Within hours of this picture being posted online, it was on the front page of newspapers worldwide. But when the media went back to reporting indigestible data, Alan Gurdi went from an innocent little boy to a forgotten statistic from devastating conflicts in the Middle East to the Uyghur Muslim crisis in China, we avoid mass atrocities because we view statistics as hollow numbers. Nobel Peace Prize winner Wyszlowa Szymborska elaborates, history counts its skeletons in round numbers. A thousand and one remains a thousand. As if the one had never existed. 83 million, eight, one. So what do these numbers mean? Well, 83 million represents the number of Americans who believe the sun revolves around the earth. Eight is the number of people watching a fantastic oratory right now. And one is the person who forgot a banana in their locker before quarantine started. 
this just goes to show we can't connect with pure statistics because our compassion has deflated. Now, we don't purposefully try to avoid the lives behind the statistics. We do so because we innately feel keeping cool in the face of mass suffering has its benefits. But by doing so, we lose what makes us human, our deep empathy. Decision-making psychologist Daniel Kane made elaborates, instead of allowing ourselves to grieve over the suffering of others, we immediately try to control our emotions. Psychology professor Deborah Smalls elaborates, we are facing a global collapse of compassion. As the number of people in need increases, our empathy for them decreases. And in turn, our compassion has died. Additionally, statistics don't impact us because our brains can't process large numbers. Psychic numbing, as coined by psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, is a psychological phenomenon that causes us to feel indifferent to the suffering of large numbers of people. Now, we greatly value saving one life, but as the number of lives at risk increases, psychic numbing desensitizes us. Because what's one more person, right? Even though COVID-19 deaths in the US surpass 9-11 deaths every single day, we remain indifferent. Even though hundreds of thousands of people die in isolation due to this virus on a weekly basis, we remain indifferent. And even though a mob of hundreds stormed the Capitol unmasked and what is now being labeled not just an act of domestic terrorism, but also a super spreader event, we remained indifferent to the point that we failed to convict the person responsible. Our collective ignorance of the human tendency to avoid mass suffering has turned us from characters of compassion to creatures of cruelty. Two years ago, my school went into a lockdown. After it was over, we learned that a man with a loaded gun ran across our campus. Security footage showed him racing through the school with hundreds of students smelling about, going absolutely unnoticed. Everyone was horrified and I remember hearing a phrase that shook me to my core. Our school almost became a statistic. And I realized that if a shooting had occurred, my friends and classmates and teachers would have been reduced to a victim count and tossed aside, lost amidst a sea of statistics. But they have vibrant lives and their stories deserve to be heard. Now, I have to be honest, there isn't a neat end all be all solution to this issue because numbers will continue to desensitize us and overexposure will continue to numb us. But what we can do is learn to be a little more compassionate. It's time for a desensitization intervention. And I am just realizing that's a total mouthful. So here's an acronym, ACT, ACT. First A, acknowledge. Acknowledge your feelings during times of crisis. Express your emotions by calling a friend, using a punching bag, or simply screaming into a pillow. By recognizing your emotions, you'll increase your compassion for others. Next, C. Care. Care for others in any way you can. Whether it's by delivering meals, donating money, or sewing masks, when you do something to help, you'll be showing compassion and actively contributing to solving a crisis. Finally, T, think. Think of the individuality. When you see statistics relaying the struggles of others, try and imagine the lives behind them. Envision them, humanize them, and don't let them be lost to the data. The New York Times embraced this concept. They marked 100,000 COVID-19 deaths in the US, not by boxing these victims into a single statistic, but by creating a list of names with a description that depicted the uniqueness of each life lost. We will never forget Lila A. Fenwick, the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Law, 
or Fred Walter Gray, who liked his bacon and hash browns crispy, or William D. Greek, who thought it was important to know every person's story. It is paramount. We acknowledge the stories behind the data and see the value of their existences, not as a mere statistical calculation, but as a vibrant celebration. It's time to act. By learning to show compassion, even in the face of data overload, we will learn to grow, to love, to thrive. Are we ready for our next speaker? Yep. So. All right. I think Naomi is still uh, not here. So let's go to Shub. Uh, I think Naomi oh. and uh, Shuba are both here. All yeah. Right. Both of our right. double inners have come in now. Perfect. Um, then let's pop back up to Naomi. Okay. I, I mean, it doesn't matter to me if we go in order. I just wanted to make sure we didn't skip her by accident. No, appreciate so. it. I didn't see her enter. <sighs> Thank you. Um, are all my judges ready? Okay. Give me one second. Cool. Okay. Ready. Okay. I am a grade A gamer girl. Now I might only play one game, but I'm talking about the most influential game of our lifetime, Sims 4. I've always loved the Sims games. When I was nine, my sister and I embarked on a journey to create an entire Sims town, and after hours of planning, arguing, and intense outfit designing, we had made 15 Sims, all living in the beautiful city we had created. What I never realized is that our town looked like it fit perfectly within the cast of Friends. Or Full House. Or How I Met Your Mother. It possessed that mystical, unwavering quality that ran through every one of those shows. Everyone was white. And looking back on it, we never made a Sim who wasn't white. In fact, we avoided creating Black characters. It had just seemed wrong. And while my whitewashed virtual utopia seems more like a me problem than a you problem, it indicates a broader phenomenon. In a 2005 journal article written by critical scholar Donna K. Bivins, she explains that as people of color are victimized by racism, we unknowingly internalize it. That is, we develop ideas and beliefs that support our own oppression. Internalized racism is often neglected in our conversations about race, but it is a tool that traps communities of color in a vicious cycle and blames them for their own oppression. So let's explore how internalized racism has been cultivated, why it poses a threat to the black community and the ways that we can begin to treat what writer Bianca M. Blakesley calls the hidden wound of white supremacy. So what made nine-year-old me decide to create an entire town of Chris Pratt lookalikes? Well, let's jump back to the 19th century to gain some more insight. After the Civil War and the abolition of slavery, many successful Black figures promoted conformity to white America as the only path for success. According to a 2014 Descent Magazine article, Booker T. Washington, a prominent member of the Black community, chastised Black America for being ignorant and inexperienced, insisting that the only way to achieve success was to stay quiet and try to appease their oppressors. This is better known as respectability politics, a philosophy that claims that in order to uplift a race, one must assimilate into the dominant culture and achieve their standards of respectability. And while this was used as a survival tactic back then, 
it is still a part of our everyday lives, painting white standards of behavior as the default for society. And we can see this message carried into our media. An article by the Perception Institute discusses how Black characters are often portrayed as formulaic tropes linked to criminality and poverty, and how these stereotypes have almost become synonymous with Blackness itself. That example, MTVs from G's to Jets, a reality TV show revolving around 16 young men who get transformed from rowdy hoodlums to proper gentlemen. Allison Page's 2011 article, Advance Your Freedom, discusses how in the first episode, a Black contestant admits, I'm either dead or in jail if I don't change. But rather than even acknowledging the criminalization these Black men face, the show focuses on changing their style, their manners, and the way they speak to be more respectable. In other words, our media paints whiteness as the answer to Black people's problems, teaching them to internalize that their Blackness is the problem. Internalized racism has plagued our culture for centuries, and it's time that we recognize its detrimental consequences. First, it creates divides within Black communities. There's Karen D. Pike defines defensive othering as a consequence of internalized racism or minority groups attempt to differentiate themselves from others in the same group to distance themselves from negative stereotypes. In an interview with NPR in 2017, Nana Kua Muhammad explains, being a Black girl and being an African, my parents would always say things like, don't be like those Black Americans. But in their mind, that meant don't be the stereotypes we know about Black Americans. Her parents' attempts to distance themselves from these stereotypes is understandable, but it only ends up affirming the very anti-Black beliefs that they are trying to get away from. And in the process, this turns members of a marginalized community against each other, rather than focusing the blame on the systems that are hurting them in the first place. This internalization of anti-Blackness can also negatively impact self-conception in Black youth. In a 2006 UCLA Journal article, an elementary school teacher describes how her young Black student burst into tears one day, giving up because he knew he would never be smart enough. She goes on to explain that this common mindset in Black students doesn't come from nowhere because they are repeatedly told by the media and even by some educators that just being who they are is already a barrier to success. And this doesn't just harm their mental health. It is one of the causes for the high secondary school dropout rates for Black students. As National Center for Education Statistics found in 2018, graduation rates were 10% higher for white students than for Black students. And while there are a myriad of reasons for this difference, we cannot ignore the mindset that teaches Black children that if we don't change who we are, there is no point in trying. And until we confront these consequences, we'll continue to grow up in a world where we believe that we are the problem. When I first joined the speech and debate community in ninth grade, I made a vow. I would never talk about my race in a speech. I wrote about mental health, suicide prevention, I even wrote an oratory on chasing your dreams. Yeah, I know, but it was freshman year, cut me some slack. But I avoided anything about my race and it was how I approached the rest of my life as well. I laugh it off when I hear a racial slur. I worked hard to change the way that I spoke. I was even proud when people told me I sounded white. I was afraid. That if I ever defended my Blackness, all I'd ever be is that angry Black girl. I was afraid that if I talked about racial issues here, it would be just another angry Black piece. I was so afraid that if I wasn't as white as possible, I would be Black. And when you've been taught your entire life that Blackness is a problem. You feel like you have no other choice but to fix it. Over the past couple of years, as I've spent more time in spaces like speech and debate, where people are unafraid to be unapologetically themselves, I've begun to unlearn this mindset. But this isn't going to be fixed by one girl looking down and realizing all of her sins are white. While this mindset might be internal, 
we can't start to fix it until we focus on the societal anti-Blackness that's causing it. First, while we can't directly change what the media is showing us, we can't change the media we consume. Shows like from G's to Gents will always exist to tell people of color that we need to change. But if we understand the harm that this is creating, we can focus our energy on media that does the opposite. For example, hit shows like Blackish provide a representation of a family that isn't confined by anti-Black stereotypes, but can still embrace their cultural identity. If we support media like this, that uplifts people of color as they are, we give youth the representation we deserve. The depiction of our identity is not as a problem, but as a point of pride. But we can't stop there. We need to redefine what success looks like. We've all grown up in a world where the white standard of behavior is the universal standard for success. And while dismantling this centuries old mindset isn't gonna happen overnight, we can start right here. In speech and debate, one thing we can do is stop equating sounding articulate with sounding white. Using AABE, African American Vernacular English, does not devalue an argument. And when our ballot still tells students that it isn't professional, that it isn't respectable, it silences voices in a community centered around speaking up. If we dismantle these norms in our own community first, we can create an environment where success doesn't have to mimic whiteness where all of our identities are their own form of success. So, big news, I made a black sim. And yeah, I haven't played the sims in over five years, but it's still an accomplishment. It's a symbol that I'm growing and I'm learning these harmful biases, that I want as many people as possible to be able to do the same. By understanding how this issue has been cultivated, how it creates rifts between a person and their identity, and how we can fight it in our everyday lives, we bring awareness to this hidden wound we're so afraid to talk about. The sooner we shine a light on internalized racism, the sooner we can teach the next generation to embrace their identities, not run away from them, to love themselves for their Blackness and not in spite of it. We'll teach them to internalize a new message that Black is beautiful too. Thank you. Are the other judges ready for our next speaker? Yep. All right. Now we're ready for shoot. Hey, can you guys hear and see me all right? Awesome. I'll go ahead and get started. Good old Murica, land of the free and home of the brave. But as much as we Americans love to tout our superiority, we don't exactly have the best image overseas. In one video, YouTube content creator Yaffa asked dozens of foreigners what they thought of Americans. One lady said, fake and superficial. Clearly she's never been to a speech tournament. Another man said, jolly, overweight and polite. I guess he thinks we're all Santa Claus? Could be worse. But by far the most common response was a combination of the words loud, arrogant, and overly patriotic. In fact, this image has become so apparent, it has a name, the ugly American, the ignorant, overweight, ethnocentric citizen with a passion for guns, capitalism, and golf. That sounds familiar. But the ugly American image is just that, an image. A snapshot of 320 million diverse individuals whose lives are riddled with nuance. And while that may seem obvious, we form and follow snapshots like this one on a daily basis. University of Florida cognitive psychologist Jamie Hale explains that our brains love to take the puzzle pieces of the human experience and put them together in this grand depiction of reality. But oftentimes this grand depiction is no more than a simplified, 
even false depiction. We're living life on 4K, but the people we meet, the issues we explore, and the decisions we make are based on as little information as possible, a single snapshot. And I fear that if left unaddressed, that these snapshots will begin to obscure the beautiful complexity in our world today. So let's zoom into these snapshots and get a better idea of how they come to be in our nation. Next, we'll examine their impacts on our decision making before finally learning to look beyond the photograph. Because they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but our world, the human race, you and I, we're worth more than that. Now, the ugly American image has been around for decades, but shot into the spotlight under Donald Trump's presidency. And while that may seem unfair, judging an entire country based on one person, that's how many of our snapshots come to be, by looking through a single vantage point. Now, as kids, our parents got us to believe some pretty crazy stuff. My parents told me I could be anything I wanted when I grew up, until the day I told my mom I wanted to be a rapper, and she told me to wrap up my math homework. But perhaps the biggest lie we all believed was Santa Claus, an elf-loving, super-rich, time-traveling, ninja-slash-philanthropist-slash-stalker who also happens to have the appetite of a three-year-old. But we bought into this snapshot of Christmas magic, causing us to ignore all the signs for years until Jeremy in second grade ruined it for the whole class. Yet our single vantage point mentality transcends St. Nick, Ikranur. In a June 10th, 2020 article details one byproduct of our single vantage point mentality, confirmation bias. The process by which we give more weight to evidence that's in line with our pre-existing beliefs than the evidence that isn't. And we've seen this. At the beginning of the pandemic, there were some interesting conspiracy theories about the nature and spread of the novel coronavirus. Everything from a hoax created by China to in the words of my uncle, 5G is the real super spreader. Yeah, many of these theories are alive and well today. The reason? Well, as explained by a study conducted just this month by the University of Basel, it's confirmation bias. The researchers concluded that participants who believed in these conspiracies had developed these rigid but false snapshots of the pandemic, one reinforced by the information they consumed on a daily basis. In other words, confirmation bias has grown so pervasive that they continue to be unwilling to accept any other possibility. And the effects are disastrous. It's why BBC in May of 2020 reports that the 5G super spreader conspiracy has resulted in mob attacks in India, mass poisonings in Iran, and telecommunication towers set to fire in the United Kingdom, all in an attempt to impose their snapshots into reality. Now, the American people aren't the only thing Donald Trump represented, but he perfectly encapsulates the 2020 experience. I mean, he got COVID, lost his job, and got evicted. But it's safe to say that 2020 didn't bring out the best decision-making from any of us, and neither do snapshots, as they accelerate the decision-making process. In their 2018 publication, Think Critically, Authors Peter Fascioni and Carol Atkins explain that all of our decisions are made by one of two brain systems. System one, intuitive and impulsive, and system two, logical and slow. But when we make snapshots by reducing people or issues, we prime system one to take over. And all of our decisions are made in the blink of an eye. And in our need for speed, well, we begin to jump to conclusions. On January 18th, 2019, a short video clip from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial was posted online. On one side, Nathan Phillips, an Omaha tribe elder. And on the other, Nicholas Sandman, a Kentucky high schooler in a MAGA hat smirking at the Omaha elder. Twitter erupted in a firestorm of tweets, calling the student racist and ignorant. The news outlets and celebrities criticized his actions, accusing the student of disrespecting Mr. Phillips. Even I, as a fellow Kentucky high schooler, was especially disgusted and vocal about the situation on social media. But as more evidence from the day, the day came out, it became clear that there was a misunderstanding. It hadn't been the student who'd approached the Omaha elder to taunt him, but rather the other way around. And the right was far from innocent in all of this. Upon learning about the situation, political commentators and news outlets on the right propped up Sandman as this damsel in distress, 
and victim of cancel culture. Even though Sandman was never canceled and is arguably doing better now than ever before. This twofold jump to a conclusion only led to a widening of the partisan gap in our already hyper-partisan nation, all because of one misleading snapshot. And snapshots don't just cause us to jump to conclusions about situations, but people as well. A 2019 study from Princeton University found that it only takes our brains a tenth of a second to determine someone's character, personality, or trustworthiness based solely on their external features. And while that may seem harmless at first, after all, first impressions are key. Its effects can be devastating. A tenth of a second is enough for us to see the cartoon caricatures on our TV and impose them on our neighbors. A tenth of a second is enough for us to wrongly assume someone's race, gender, or ethnic origin and make them feel unwelcome. And a tenth of a second is enough for a police officer to see a black man reaching into his SUV and decide to pull the trigger. When we jump to conclusions, we jump over the truth. So how? How can we begin to see past these snapshots that divide us? Stop, drop, and roll. Three words to help us get out of a potentially deadly situation. If your clothes catch on fire, stop what you're doing, drop to the ground, and roll back and forth until the fire's out. Because in these life and death situations, it can be easy to just run around in circles. And at a time where it feels like our whole world is on fire, it's easier than ever to run around in circles. So we need three different words to help us extinguish this fire. Stop, ask, and listen. Stop, when faced with a decision or situation, rather than making a snap judgment, let's stop ourselves. As explained by psychologist Maxime de Souza, just taking two seconds to pause can help us override the pre-existing biases and beliefs that we so heavily rely on. Once we've stopped, let's ask. Let's ask ourselves, do we really have all the information here? Is there something we can ask to better understand this person or issue or social media video? If not, great. But if so, let's wait and ask the necessary questions with an open mind. Finally, we need to be willing to listen, to listen to our brothers and sisters of whatever race, gender, or ethnic origin they may be of, to listen to their stories and listen to their concerns. And from there, let's form our own nuanced opinions. Hi, I'm Shub. I know it's a little late for introductions, but hopefully we can recognize that despite the virtual nature of all this, we're not pixels on a screen, we're human beings. And the sooner we can recognize each other's humanity, the sooner we can break through the 2D screens and snapshots that divide us and come closer together and stand as one nation with liberty and justice for all. Everybody ready for the last speaker? Yep. All right. Yep. Jihan. Hello. And is it okay if I time myself on the side? Thank you. And am I good to go whenever? My life is a Greek tragedy. As the oldest child of six, it just feels like someone opened up Pandora's box in the Abdi household. I mean, my brother stole my phone and sent a group text to my speech coach and team members telling them I had a crush on Matthew Gray Goobler. I mean, it's true, but they didn't need to know that. I'm exactly like the mythological Greek figure Prometheus. According to Greek mythology, 
The god Zeus chained Prometheus to the top of the mountain, where each day an eagle would tear his body apart. Prometheus would die this horrible death each day, only to be rejuvenated each night and have to face the same fate again a few hours later. Okay, so maybe I'm not exactly like Prometheus, but I do believe we live under Prometheus's shadow. We live in a time of trauma. Bessel van der Kolk writes in his book, The Body Keeps the School, that people who have trauma aren't only the soldiers and the refugees. It happens to us, our friends, our families, our neighbors, collectively. More disturbing today, however, is the growing impact of the collective battles we faced as a global community. The truth is, we don't deal with our collective trauma. And until we do, we will suffer the consequences. So today let's consider how we don't deal with our collective trauma. By first, looking at how collective trauma perpetuates itself. Second, how it impacts our lives. Then, the harms. And finally, some solutions. Bound to the top of the mountain, left to be dismembered each day by Zeus's eagle, Prometheus knew suffering. Just like a Minnesota Vikings fan. Poor Prometheus, like, oh my Zeus! In his attempt to comfort humanity and protect them from Zeus's anger, Prometheus could see something that we often don't understand. And that's how collective trauma perpetuates itself. Sociologist Kai Erickson originally documented the idea of collective trauma in 1976, when he studied the impact of a natural disaster on community. It was a flood that not only destroyed the town, but left residents disoriented and disconnected in ways that lasted for years. And that's because when collective trauma goes unacknowledged, it has a tendency to perpetuate itself in a number of ways. Tamara Hill, licensed therapist and certified trauma professional, explains that trauma can be intergenerational. When someone or even a group of people experience trauma and they do not cope with it, they often find other strategies to avoid, ignore, or medicate their pain. Over time, these strategies become normalized passed down to the next generation, and even accepted as just a part of the culture. But collective trauma can also perpetuate itself, as a writer for the Canadian Center for the Victims of Torture explains. When underlying causes go unaddressed, war crimes that go untried, genocides that are not prosecuted, or even continual and frequent racial violence that goes unchecked, the whole society will suffer from the culture of pain because you do not need to be a direct victim of collective trauma to suffer at its feet. We've normalized so many stories and pictures of trauma into our culture, starting with Prometheus, Hercules, and all those other Greek tales, all the way up to criminal minds. Seriously, people, that's like 15 seasons of trauma. As a consequence, as a consequence, we don't really understand how it impacts our lives. We usually find different ways to cope with collective trauma, but coping should not be confused with healing. Petula Vorak of the Washington Post illustrates the difference. In the days after 9-11, people were united as one. Liberals and conservatives came together. A Republican president even spoke kindly and reassuringly at a mosque and people from across the country gathered their voices to sing God bless America. But they didn't face their trauma head on. In a very short time, they just redirected their pain onto a whole group of people, labeling us terrorists and extremists. And America coped, but America did not heal. Professor Huber author of the 2020 book, Collective Trauma, warns that it has other impacts as well. We often cope with collective trauma by disassociating ourselves from the event, becoming numb in order to protect ourselves from deeply painful emotions. 
this individual dissociation multiplies and creates a collective denial or collective unconsciousness as we attempt to disconnect ourselves from the pain. But in doing so, we make it extremely difficult to identify, talk about, or treat the wounds within our communities. We are bound by our collective traumas. We have a little idea of how to collectively heal. And perhaps the greatest impact of our collective trauma is our racialized trauma. Risma Menekum in his book, My Grandmother's Hands, argues that white bodies carry this white supremacy as trauma, as something that is accumulated over time, quietly building up until even the sight of a black body triggers responses of fear, anger, and even violence. It's a history of trauma that predates even the concept of race itself, where white bodies in Europe, according to historian Barbara Tuckman, were regularly traumatized by the all too common practices of brutality, torture, and public executions, turning many of these displays into public entertainment. These bodies carried their trauma to this country where it became racialized to maintain a social and economic order. These were seeds of trauma planted in white bodies that grew until it just didn't seem out of the ordinary. For 4,000 people right here in Minnesota to watch the spectacle of executing 38 Dakota wives in 1862, or the mob of thousands who showed up in Duluth to brutally murder three innocent black men in 1920. I'm not trying to absolve white bodies from taking responsibility for these horrific acts, but this can add some nuance to why white bodies respond as they do when they come into contact with non-white bodies. Because whatever approach we are taking now, it is not enough. We are all broken, white and black bodies. But until white bodies can confront and grow out of their trauma, until black bodies are given the chance to heal and mend. Our nation's trauma will continue to be our nation's tragedy. In the end, Prometheus was liberated from his agony after he gave up an important secret to Zeus. And that's a good map for the rest of us because we too must give up our secrets, our secret trauma. For starters, we need to be more mindful of the trauma that we pass on and trigger in our digital spaces. Winnie Gare Walker explains in an October 2020 HuffPost article that we often think we are helping when we post and share videos of Black individuals getting brutally hurt or killed. But this can be a terrorizing experience for those who live with the constant reminders that their bodies are not safe within our communities. Second, we need to listen to our physical bodies. Many times our bodies will tell us what our minds cannot. So even though we may be unaware of the collective trauma we carry, our bodies keep the score. Working with trained counselors, therapists, and support groups, along with meditative, breathing, and physical activity can give our bodies the chance to heal. And third, we can confront our collective trauma. A 2019 issue of the US News and World Report explains that collective trauma can be alleviated through collective efforts, such as recognition, remembrance, and communal therapy. Did I? The phrase Promethean task has come to represent an act of defiance. Taking on our trauma is also an act of defiance against the belief that it is the result of a personal shortcoming or that it has made us inferior or defective. We have been hurt, but we can heal. Because like Prometheus, our trauma does not need to become our destiny. Thank you to everybody and good luck. Thank you all, good luck. Thank you guys, have a great day.
Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank for you judging. so much for judging. Have a great day, everyone.